Praise the Lord. I am excited. I am a little nervous because there is a huge responsibility every time you come and minister the gospel. And um, I, uh, when Pastor and I, um, he asked me to minister for the last service, I said, well, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it, you know. Um, I don't ever say no. But then I went home and I prayed and I said, I didn't hear nothing, nothing for weeks, right, until about maybe two, three weeks ago, my pastor's wife got up and she was leading worship and she said something and it just clicked one day. And I do the, I do the sound at our, at our church. And so she said something that just clicked. And so I wrote down some things and, and um, I, I said, man, I told my, my, the guy that, my, one of the brother's sons, he helps me. And he, and I said, man, God just spoke to me. I, my message is there. And I've been waiting for that. So Amen. So I got a good message. I mean, I, it's what God spoke to me. Amen. Um, first of all, and I did this to my church this morning, I just want to congratulate you, each and every one of you. And you say, well, why? Well, because we have about two days left of this year, and I just want to congratulate you on making it to the end of this year. Amen. Because do you know how many people, I've been in service, I've been serving the Lord for just over 20 years, and how many guys, and not guys, I'm how many people have left the church throughout the 20 plus years that I've been serving the Lord? How many people have left the church for whatever reason? And to make it to the end and start a new year off right, man, it's such a blessing to still be in church. Because you could be at the bar. You could be waking up hungover this morning. You could be, I mean, there's tons of things you could be right now, right? But so I want to congratulate you on making this. So give yourselves a round of applause, Amen. It's not easy, amen? So, with that said, I'm going to get everybody to stand up real quick, just real quick, amen? And I want you to do this. I just want you to shake. Just shake. Just come on. I want you to shake off this past year, amen? All right, now sit down. Some of you are having too much fun. Sit down. Now, listen, I, I want you to shake off the past year, amen? This year has brought you, who knows, heartache, pain, I mean, this year's been tough for me, amen. I lost my brother in January, amen. Well, a really good friend in February. It's been really, and then throughout the problems at work and, and life and, and all these things that happen, amen. It's been rough. But right now, just shake it off. Let it go. Because you're about to walk into a new year. You're about to walk into something new, something fresh. Uh, I was talking to Danielle and Corey, and I said, man, you, if there's anybody in this room, aside from Jordan this past year, was if there's anybody who has something new, it's, it's, it's Sister Danielle. She's about to have a baby. I hope you don't mind me saying that. But everybody knows. And so she's about to have a baby. She's got something new. Amen? Something exciting. Amen? So the Tyler's message, it was originally going to be, how do you see, what do you see, and can you see it clearly, right? But then I was, like, I was talking to Pastor Sean, and I said, you know what, do you see what I see? And Pastor was like saying, you know what, you, you know, a lot of churches are going to be talking about vision. Now I'm going to talk about vision a, little bit, vision a little bit. And simply, you know, a lot of the mistakes and the failures that's happened this past year, amen, they're done. And I want you to get ready, amen, for what God has something new. Because something 2020 is a new year. Something new, new blessings, new opportunities, amen. And so I was looking at the optometrist uh, terminology for 2020 vision and there's a term called vision acuity anybody ever heard that vision acuity vision acuity is simply the clarity or sharpness of a vision amen somebody can you put up that picture everybody's seen this before right come on now listen now normal no here, here's something i didn't find out when i was researching i didn't realize normal vision is 2020 i grew up thinking no, 20 if you had 2020 vision you had good clear vision like man you know you have 2020 vision but i didn't realize that 2020 is actual normal vision so i've been abnormal my entire life because i've been blind by one eye i'm sure of it but 2010 is actually did anybody know that 2010 is actually really good vision who knew that amen so 2010 was actually new, good vision and so I started thinking about that, and so now if you cover, how, how many have been in the test, and you look at it, you look at that picture, right, and you cover one eye, and it looks a little blurry, and you're able to read the first, everybody can see E, then you go on, you see F and P, you see the third row, but for some of us, more likely myself, when you get to like the fourth row, you start seeing, see it says L-P-E-D, but some of us will see P-D-O-A or something, right, 
And we start to, you cover each eye and they make you, and that's how they determine where you're at or whatever the case, right? And so the eye test with the letters, it's easy to get to the third and the fourth row. It's easy. But it, your vision starts to get a little blurry as you go down just a little further. As you get deeper, it starts just getting a little blurry. And so if you put glasses on, though, you're able to probably, for some of us, if I know if I got glasses, I'd probably be able to read the fifth, sixth row. Maybe even the seventh. Who knows? So I began to realize as I began to study, man, you can see a little bit more closely as you begin to see things the right way. Does that make sense? So with that, uh, I, my wife and I, we raised four daughters. And, and uh, two of those daughters wore glasses on top of my wife. So my two daughters, Nat's one of them, and my other daughter, Serena, and my wife, Veronica, she, we, they wore glasses. And so over the years, amen, um, you know, I'd mess around. It, glasses would be on the table, and I'd put their glasses on. And anybody ever did that? You put glasses on, you're like, oh, gosh, you are blind, you know? And then some of them were like, well, not too bad, you know? I was like, all right, you know, I, I could kind of see you use it as a magnifying glass. But I, I realized, the re- why, why do you think that is? It's because we all have different visions, we all have different sights. Same goal, but different sights. And so you try to see things through the lens of somebody else's eyes or through somebody else's lens, and you can't see it clearly. So it's easy to lose sight of the vision. Does that make sense? But when you begin to see things the way God wants you to see it, through the eyes of Scripture, through God's eyes, then the goals that God gives us, which one is, is to make it to heaven, the goals become a little more clear, and it gets easier to realize what you need to do to get there. Does that make sense? And so I, I, I begin to, you know, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. I'm going to give you three visions that I believe God, there's, there's a whole lot of lists of things that I could have listed, but for time's sake, amen, uh, there's just a couple, there's just like, I, I just picked one. I was like, wow, how am I going to do that? So uh, I'm going to give you three things. Vision for the body of Christ. I'm going to give you a vision for the local church. And I'm going to give you a vision for the individual. Okay? So vision for the local, for, for the body of Christ as a whole. One of them is to build on this truth. Okay? Are you ready? The vision as a, as a body as a whole, we're to build that Christ is everything. Listen to me. Let me say that again. Christ is is everything. He's not some things. He's not most things. He is everything. And he has to be everything. Because if he is not everything in your life, other things will distract you and it gets easier to say, I don't got to go to church today. Let me take a step further. I'm too tired to read my Bible today. I'm too tired to pray. I'm too tired to share the gospel. You ever been in an opportunity where you ever felt tugged and and, and and you feel like, man, I should invite this person to church, or I should tell them that Jesus loves them more, or I should pray for this person. You ever felt tugged like that and you just didn't do it? Missed opportunity. For whatever reason, I could give you explanations. I could tell you sometimes I was lazy. Sometimes I was too embarrassed. Sometimes I just wasn't prayed up that day and I didn't feel like sharing it. That's the reality. But if we stay connected to the gospel, you got to realize in your life and as a body, as a whole, And I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about every believer as a whole. We need to remember that Christ is everything. Why? Because in today's society, Christ isn't everything. You have Christian churches who preach against Christ. You have Christian churches who say that you don't need Jesus to get to heaven. That you could pray and do some other things. That you could do certain prayers or or walk a certain way or act a certain way. And you'll be fine. Just be a good person. Pay your taxes. Work hard. And you'll be okay. But that's not the truth. Jesus Christ is the only way, the life, and the truth. And he says so. And he even says this, no man comes to the Father except through me. So Christ and and Jesus is everything. His word is sufficient. You have to understand, he is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do. And, and, And he says who he is. And until Christ is everything, we're living in a manner that is, what the Bible says in James, to and fro. To and fro. And he says, a man who's to and fro is unstable in all his ways. 
But until Christ is everything, now you begin to look at, look at Christ through the, eye, through the lens of the gospel, through God's eyes, and you realize Christ is everything. When you first start out, it's a little tough to do that because you don't know enough about Christ. You don't know nothing about the Bible, and you're starting to read, you're starting to understand. But see, I've, I've come to learn after 20-plus years of serving the Lord that, that the application of the gospel of what I read is when I begin to understand what, I, what, what the Bible's saying. Does that make sense? So some of us haven't really gone through some of the issues. You read about certain issues. You read about certain trials and tribulations. But yet because you haven't gone through it, it doesn't make sense to you. I'm not saying you have to go through problems to understand the Bible. But some of these things are not understood unless you have to put faith into You know, it took faith for, uh, who was it that said, uh, Lord, if it's you, call me to come out to you. Who was that, John or Peter? Peter. And Peter said, Peter sees, Peter sees Jesus, or a, a ghost, he thought, right, in the water. And they're in the, they're, there's all these waves crashing against the boat. And he sees Jesus, and he says, Lord, if that's you, call me to come out to you. And Jesus says, come. Well, it took faith for Peter to get off the boat and to begin to walk on. I mean, come on, who would really do that? Who would really get off a boat when the waves are crashing against it? There's all these crazy waves. Who would get out in their right mind, would get off the boat and think, I'm going to start walking on water. But he trusted. He had faith enough in Jesus to get off the boat. But what happened? He lost sight. He took his eyes off the Lord. And the Bible says that he began to drown. He began to sink. And I love it because it says, he called upon the Lord. You know, I could picture myself, Lord, help me, I'm drowning. You call me to come out to you and I'm drowning. And I can see Jesus telling me, you shouldn't have looked away. But the Bible doesn't say that he said that. The Bible says immediately, immediately he cast up his hand, he reached out his hand, and he pulled him up. So the point of that is that if you keep your eye, what would have happened if Peter, Pastor, would have never took his eyes off, off Jesus? What could have happened? I mean, we can only imagine what would have happened if he would have stayed focused and begin to walk with Jesus on the water. Whoo, man, what a sight to see. Amen. It wasn't no magic trick like, uh, like uh, what's that guy, Chris, uh, Chris Angel, who walks on the pool water and all this. That's all magic stuff. But Jesus and Peter literally walked on water. You know, there's a lot of things fighting for the spotlight of Christ. How many can say that today? If you look at your life, there are a lot of things, music, job, family, uh, sports games. I mean, you name it. Sunday football. How many people don't come to church because they want to watch football? There's so many things that, in, that, that are taking up the spotlight from our, uh, uh, trying to take Christ from being everything in our lives. Amen. Look at what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1. Listen to what it says. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So, excuse me. So he is first in everything. I want you to understand something today. That if the Bible tells, says, the Bible says this, I could do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I want you to know he means it. I want you to know that the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror. I want you to know he means it. I want you to know that you can hold on to those things when he says that I could do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He means it, church. So when you face those trials and tribulations, amen, and you didn't know how to get through it, all you got to do is hold on and cry out to Jesus. And the Bible says that he will give you the strength that you need. He will give you the strength that you need to hold on, to keep going, to press forward, to stay focused on him. But you got to rely and trust in Jesus. So I just want to remind you today that if it says it, he means it. The second vision is for the local church. Let's just say this church today. Even for those who are listening, to preach repentance from sin and dead works and call people to run to Christ. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Listen to what it says. If you want to go there, brother, real quick. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter. You ever been preached to and you feel like, man, ah, oh man, pastor was. Does pastor know my issues? Does he know what I'm going through? 
You ever been, you ever feel, hear, hear a word and you're like, man, that was for me. Like, man, you're sitting in your church and you're like crouching. I remember in the beginning when I first came to church, amen, you start hearing these messages and you swear, it's like Jesus, like, like the pastor's talking directly at you. You start like bawling up in your chair like, man, who knows my issues, who knows my problems. But that's not the case. See, here Peter wrote a letter to the, to the Corinthians, and he's writing and said, look, I'm not, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Amen. Come on. So what God wants you to do is sometimes you crouching in your chair amen, is a good thing because Jesus wants you to change. He's looking for you to change. He's looking for you to call on him and look to him. Amen. So he can bring about what's new in your, what's going to be new in your life. So the second vision for the local church is for us to preach, gospel, preach the gospel. The Bible says in Romans, how shall they hear unless someone goes and preaches? How will somebody feed the homeless unless somebody goes? Am I right? How many, how, so I, again, I ask you, have you ever been sat there and you're like, man, I should share this, share the gospel with somebody. I should pray. You're talking with somebody at a gas station or something, and, and you just feel this little nudge. I, I want to encourage you to respond to that nudging, to that, uh, what's the word for it? I, to the prompting too, I guess. Filling up little prompt, feeling a little urge to share, to preach, to pray, whatever the case. I want to encourage you, in this new year, amen, take advantage of those opportunities. You'll never know what could come out unless you take advantage of those opportunities. Amen. So I want to encourage you, amen, share the gospel in this new year. Amen. See, some of us may say, um, you ever have anybody tell you this? Oh, I'm good, bro. Oh, I don't need that. I've preached so many times. We'd be preaching like in, we used to have a church in National City, and we'd be preaching in, in, on, on Highland, amen, over by the, uh, by the price breakers. And, and we'd be preaching, you know, all kinds of people coming through, and people like, I'm good, man. I don't need that stuff, you know. I'm glad it's working for you, hey, you know. But, and, 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 and they're right, you know. They just don't want it. But here's what I've come to learn. And even with people like at our jobs and people in our family, here's what I've come to learn. That people are watching you. They may say they're good. They may say that they don't need it, amen. But the reality is, is that they're watching you because they really do need it. They just don't realize how much they do need it until it's time. Until it's time. And so if we are walking in a manner that is worthy to call, to, that is that's bringing honor to Christ, if you're walking in a manner that brings glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, let me tell you something. They're watching you. If you call yourself a Christian, somebody's watching you. So why not honor God in everything we do? As a church, it is our responsibility to share the gospel. That's our responsibility as a whole. Pastor Sean was just talking to you guys. Some of you guys don't know. They go out and pass food, amen. Uh, um, Pastor Rebecca, they go out and pass food, amen. You think that no one watches this church every Sunday, the people that go, amen? They watch. Yeah, they get blessed. They get fed some food. But somebody is watching, Somebody is paying attention. He may not or she may not come to this church to get saved, but Lord willing, somewhere down the line, they go to a church and they start serving the Lord. Amen. And that's the goal, amen, is to share the gospel. People don't always, you know, I've I, I, served the Lord over the years, amen. You've all, I've always come across people who say, you need to, I, one time, no joke, uh, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I just got, about, maybe 12 years ago, I had just got out of prison and I was sitting in, in, at the gym and I was working out. And I was talking to some guys, and, and these guys, man, they were on fire for the Lord. They were victory outreach guys. And they're like, man, we were going back and forth. They're like, man, bro, praise God, bro, you're on fire. And I was like, man, you too, you know. And we're just like pumping each other up, right. And then the guy goes, you know what, bro, you're victory outreach material, bro. You need to come to my church. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I got my church. I'm on fire because I'm at my church. 
And that's where I need to be. And so you got these people who try to draw people from other churches, amen. And the, the, the important is, is it's not this church, my church, any. The point is that somebody goes to church, grabs a hold of the gospel, grabs a hold of the vision, and begins to serve Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. If you're here, stay here. Stay locked in if this is your church, amen. It's important to go to a church and be locked into a church. I'm not negating that. Is it important? If this is your church, stay here, stay locked in, and keep going because God's going to grow you like a tree planted you're going to grow amen and this is when the vision and all these things god's going to meet your need and bless you and, and direct you and all these if you stay where you're at but for those who don't have a home we want to lead them to a home whether this one or the next one that's what's important and it amazes me how many people always try to do that you know it amazes me so listen a couple of weeks ago about two three weeks ago um I was going back to talking about what, you know, people are watching you. People are paying attention to what you're saying. And, and you know, people's perception of you is, is big. And so a couple of weeks ago, um, they, we had this Christmas party at work. And so, you know, the boss is like, hey, you know what, we got everybody some gag gifts. And, and uh, you know, kind of, d- d- you know, depending on how you are and, and what we, what, you know, how we're reminded of you about, about you know, just based on your, your personality or whatever, right? So I'm thinking, oh, man, they, I'm the Christian. Me and another brother who was here a little while ago, uh, um, we're the Christians of the group. So I'm thinking, oh, man, we're going to get clowned on, right? So she goes around. She passes out some pretty cool gifts. And she, you know, pretty funny gifts, some cool gifts. And they came around to me, and I, and I brought my shirt. Because they gave me a shirt, and this is, what, this is not to brag or anything, but I, I take it as a, I'm bragging. Because, you know what, this is how my, tr- how my, how my job sees me. Now, trip out. This is how my job sees me. <laughs> they gave it to me as a clown. I thought they were going to clown me, but when they gave it to me, I said, man, that's how they perceive me. This is given to me by my boss, the owner of the company. And I thought, wow, what a blessing that they see me as someone who, who preaches the gospel, you know. And they may have thought it was a little bit funny. I, I wear that as an honor. Sermonator, baby. You know what I'm saying? Listen, guys, the great commission that Jesus Christ left in Matthew chapter 28 is still alive today. It's still relevant today. It is so important for you and I as believers in the gospel. Listen, you and I have the answer, the antidote. For heaven. I'm I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The antidote for hell. We have the antidote to keep somebody out of hell. Now, I'm not talking about rocking around being all holy, roly, amen, and and, and just constantly speaking the gospel. Kind of, oh, oh, you know, oh, thou, you know, you shall not thou or whatever. You know, I'm just, I'm talking about just being a believer, loving God, and letting it come out of your life freely. Amen. Learning to live the gospel out. Learning to let go of the old. I mean, what is, what is um, Paul says, he goes, he goes, you know what? I, I've learned to let go of the past and all the things that go with it. He goes, and grab a hold of the, uh, of the future. For I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. So he goes, I've learned to let, and I'm paraphrasing, I've learned to let go of the past and all my mistakes and my old attitudes and my old way of thinking and acting and speaking and all these things. And I'm grab a hold of what's new. But so much, so, so, you know, many Christians today are holding on to the past. Many Christians today are holding on to the old attitudes, to the old ways of thinking, to the old ways of responding. Amen. But until you and I grab a hold, amen, of who Christ is, and you begin to look at Christ through the God. See, if you ain't reading your Bible, well, uh, there's a saying that uh, dusty Bible creates dusty lives. Listen, if you ain't reading your Bible, amen, it says something about your life. It really does. And I could, I, I could speak because I read my Bible. So I could say something. But if you're cringing right now, like, oh, man, good. Because I don't repent of making you feel bad, like Paul just said. Because it's going to draw you closer to Christ. Or at least that's the goal. Amen? So vision for the individual. Romans chapter 12. If we go to that one, please, bro. I beseech you, one of my favorite scriptures. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I love that. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, guys. He says, 
your reasonable service. In other words, it's the least you could do. Some of us think that if we, set, if we dedicate our lives to the Lord and we keep coming to church and we keep praying, oh, my God, another prayer meeting? Oh, my God, another class? Man, Pastor, you got too many classes. Man, church service? You know, we used to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday Bible study, Saturday morning prayers for like two, three hours. Amen. We were busy. Let me tell you something. But when I was gang banging and slanging dope, it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. When I was getting high, there was no time off. When I was drinking, amen, there was no time off. When it was time to go out with a girl or go out and party with my homies, there was no time off. But then we get saved and all of a sudden, dang, Pastor. He wants us to meet Sunday night too? Jeez. They want too much. They want too much. But the vision for the individual, listen, the Bible teaches us that we have to be, we, that we have been cleansed. Let, let me ask, I, I'm going to front you off a little bit because I don't go here. So, you know, I'm going to front you off a little bit. Who has, made the, who has made the declaration that Jesus Christ is their Savior? Amen. If you haven't, don't raise your hand. That's fine. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm just joking. But listen. I want you to understand something. That Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus loves you. If you, have, if you didn't raise your hand, I want you to know that Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for your sins. I want you to know that the change that he created in me, the change that he's created in others around us, amen, is the same change that he wants to do in your life. Amen. No, none of us are any better or any different than anybody. Amen. Jesus loves us all the same. He died, us, he died for all of us. Amen. And so... The Bible says, teaches that if you've been, that we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ and made alive by the Holy Spirit in order for us to be able to walk righteously before him. I want you to see that we're called to walk righteously before the Lord. And you say, well, bro, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know who I am. How could God forgive? How can I walk righteously? Well, let me tell you something. The Bible says the righteously simply means to be in right standing with God. So if you are in right standing, we say, well, how can I get in right standing? Well, you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible teaches us that the blood of Jesus covers our sins, amen, cleanses us from our sins. And when God looks at us, he don't look at us no more. He, looks, he sees the blood of Jesus that's on us. So that makes us in right standing. So in order for, for you and I to fulfill that vision of the individual, we have to have a right relationship with Christ. Does that make sense? You have to write a right relationship with Christ. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Except. Listen, you giving your life to Christ, that's the least you could do. Do you know? Because, well, let me rephrase it. None of us understand the pain and suffering that Christ did, took when he went to that cross. You and I don't understand the pain, the humiliation, and, the, and, and everything, the torture and the torment that Jesus went through just to die for you and I. We have no idea. And we belittle it thinking, ah, he did it for everybody else, not just for me. He did it for you. If you were the only person that needed Jesus, he did it for you. If you were the only one that needed Jesus to get to heaven, he did it for you. I had this vision a long time ago when I first, got, when I first started to preach uh, years ago. I, was, uh, um, I saw this. It was like this crowd, and I could see Jesus. This is literally a vision I had. He, I, could see Je I, I can't see Jesus, but I saw the cross. And there's a m massive amount of people in front of me. And I could hear just screaming and yelling and, and all this. And I could see the cross, and it's walking. And he's just getting closer to me. And I'm in the back of the crowd, and, I, and I'm looking. And I'm just kind of in awe and amaze. I really didn't understand. I really didn't know. But it gets, as he gets closer, I realize Jesus. And he turns and he stops. And when he stops, he kneels down. The crowd parted right at that moment. And it's almost like this aisle. The crowd parted, and I could see Jesus way over there in the street. And he looks up at me, and he smiles. And the crowd closes. And I began to cry. I remember when I woke up, I cried. And I realized that Jesus did it just for me. If I was the only person, he did it just for me. Praise God. So listen. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So now, in this new year, as you walk into this new year, there's a couple things that my hope is for. 
Because I know in this new year, there's going to be hardships, there's going to be trials, there's going to be frist- you know, frustrations, there's going to be blessings, there's going to be good times. I know that life is going to go on in this next year, amen. But my goal and my hope is this. One is that you would see beyond the battle. Listen, you're going to face hardships. That's the reality. That's life, right? And rather than getting bombarded and, cloud- and-, and-, and clouded in our minds, amen, but we need to see clearly the Lord. We need to see clearly that God's in control. Listen to what the Bible says in, in, in excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 6. I want you to understand. Let me, let me work up to this before you put it on. So in the Old Testament, the king of Syria, he's warring against king, the, Israel. And he wants to trap the king of Israel. And so he sends out guys to go and get him. And what happens is the man of God, which is Elijah, he tells the king of Israel, hey, don't go here because they're going to set a trap for you. And I'm paraphrasing, okay. He says, don't go. They're going to set a trap for you. So he, he doesn't go. And they go. And, they, and king of Syria sends these men. And he's not there. So he does it not just once, not just twice. There's a few times that it happens. And finally the king of Syria says, he gets his men together. And he goes, what's going on? Who's against us? Who's for the king of Israel? And one of his men says, Nobody. He says, the man of God is telling the king of Israel everything you're saying, including the private things that you're saying in your bedroom. And so then he says, you know what? He says, I want you to find out where the, king of, the, 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 the man of God is, Elijah, and I want you to send a bunch of men after him. So the next morning, the next, that night, they send a bunch of chariots, a bunch of horsemen. They go to and they, and they camp around, uh, which is a city called Dothan, where, the, uh, where Elijah was. And so they surround him, right? And the next morning is where the story, where we're going to read. Go ahead and put it up, brother. Uh, the next morning, this is what we have. And so therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early. So here you have Elisha had a servant, right? And it says, when he rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? You ever been there? You go, you, you. Trials are all around you, frustrations, you don't know. And all of a sudden you're just like, what do we do? How do I, get, how do I pay my bills? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to put gas in my car? My gosh, my kids don't have nothing to eat. How do I put food on the table? You ever been in that position or is that just me? Amen. And it's a tough position because you don't know what to do. And you have people come against you and you're like, how do I handle this situation? But listen. He says, I, 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 he, so he answered, Elijah said, do not fear. Don't be afraid. Relax. He said, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, this is almost like I, I can see your pastor saying, Lord, open their eyes right now. This is what he says. He said, Lord, open their eyes. Open his eyes of the young man. And he, and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of, uh, of fire all around Elijah. And so the point of that is I want you to see and realize, amen, that there are more for you than there are against you. But if you don't read the Bible, how will you know that? How can you trust in God? So I want to encourage you and remind you, first of all, there are more for you than there are against you. When you come against something this next year, remember that you have the victory. God's already given you the victory. You may not see it. You may not feel it. You may not understand it. You may not even see how, but you have the victory. Today we have a couple of our daughters, amen, they're backslidden. They go get high. They party. Amen. We've been praying for years. But you know the Bible tells me, God, this is a promise that God gave me. And you know, I'll share it with you because you can hold on to it. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, uh, uh, or 59, um, the Bible says, he says, the word that I've placed in your heart and in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, out of your heart, nor out of your, or your mouth, sorry, nor out of your seed's mouth, nor out of your seed's seed's mouth. And I pray that to the Lord. I said, Lord, you said that the seed that you've placed in my life and in my heart and in my lips will not depart out of my lips and in my heart, but you also promise to not take it out of my kids, nor out of my grandkids, and even my great-grandkids. If the Lord tarries. And I tell the Lord, and the Bible says that. Isaiah, I think it's 59, right? I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah 59, uh, verse 1 and 2. I encourage you, quote that to the Lord. Man, today I don't see how my daughters are going to repent. I don't see how they're going to stop getting high. 
I don't see how they're going to change. I just don't see it. But I know that Jesus, that the Lord promised me. And so I hold on. But if I didn't read the word, I wouldn't know. I couldn't be encouraged. I wouldn't have the hope. So I want to encourage you to look beyond, see beyond the battle that you're going to face. See, I realize that when we, fight, when we come under something and when we come under some, some type of attack or hardship, there's those pesky emotions. You know what I'm talking about? Fear. Worry, doubt, how am I going to, what's going to happen, what do I do, how do I do it? But listen, as you walk into this new year, you have to see with spiritual eyes and know that there are more for you than there are against you. One of the real things I realize is the Bible says that greater is he. Greater is he. Now listen, greater is he, stronger is he, mightier is he, more than able is he, greater is he, amen, than, than he that is in, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. God is greater than our problems. God is greater than our issues. God is greater than the things that we cannot see. God is bigger than those things. We serve that God. You are that God's son and daughter. That is your God, your father, amen, and you can hold on to him and you can cry to him when things come against you. So my hope is that you would be encouraged and remember that you got to see beyond the battle. It's, am I making sense? Amen? Amen. When you learn to see, listen to this, when you learn to see beyond, you learn to hold on to God's promises and walk in hope in spite of what you see. So you got to remember, go back to that eye test, bro. You look at this, and, and it makes sense to you. But as you stand about 20 feet away, and you, get it, and you put one eye, we're talking about, let's just say the, covering your eye is a struggle in life. Covering your eye is a hardship that you're facing. And you get about the fourth row, fifth row. Now, I don't know about you, that's a little bit big, but I can barely see the fifth row. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what's going to happen. Amen. As we get, but if you realize and you begin to allow Christ, amen, God's problem, you, in spite of what you see, you have to know that it's there. You have to know Jesus is there. You, in spite of what you see and feel, you have to remember that Jesus is there. Somebody say, Jesus is there. My second point is this. My hope is that you'll see what God called you to do. This is a big one. Let me tell you why. Well, let me talk about what I'm going to talk about. In Acts chapter 10, um, I'm going to give you a little story before I read a couple of scriptures. But in Acts chapter 10, Peter is standing in a place, and the Bible says that he gets caught up in a trance or kind of caught up in a prayer, right? And he begins to see a vision. And and, and if you ever read Acts chapter 10, the Bible says that that he sees this white sheet falling down with a bunch of four-footed animals, right? And so as the sheet comes down, um, he begins to, you know, look at it, and then he hears a voice that says, hey, take and eat, because he was hungry. He was waiting for food. And so he says, I, I will never eat anything that's unclean. And the, and the voice says, what, what, God's called un, what God's called clean, don't call unclean. And so then he's like kind of sitting there and he's kind of wondering. And the story talks about how he's wondering about the vision. He, it kind of just really didn't make sense to him, right? And in verse 17, Zach, if you want to put that on. Verse, Acts chapter 10, verse 17. Amen. And so anyways, he begins to explain. See, sometimes when we come to a vision that God has shown you, you might not understand it right away. I've had visions that I've shared a couple things. Here, let me read that real quick. It says, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Now, so what happens there, he gets called out by a guy named Cornelius, sends out these men. Cornelius had the same vision, had had a vision of a man of God who's going to come and bring him some word. And so he says, look, go send out for, go send out, uh, if you want to get number 33 too, or... uh, yeah, 33. And so he says, go out and call, 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 uh, call this man of God. And he says, go out there and, and call him, tell him to come over here. And so as he's, dream, as he's seeing this vision, Paul, uh, Peter hears a knock at the door. And these guys says, hey, look, Cornelius sent us to come and get you. We need you to come with us. So the next day he feeds them. The next day they go out, they head out. They go back to Cornelius' house. They're at Cornelius' house. And Cornelius says, look, man, when you, when you did this vision, man, he goes, man, I, I was seeing that there was this man of God. And, and he's telling him, look, I'm so glad you came. And then I, at the same time, he said, well, I had this vision of all these things happening, right? And so here in verse 33, he says, so I sent for you. This is Cornelius speaking. He says, so I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So listen, here is a man of God who has a vision and he says, 
I have to really understand what's going on. I don't really know what's going on, why, why God showed me this vision. And he goes, I know it has something to do with ministry, but, I, I, you know, he, he really didn't get it. You ever been there? You ever, maybe this past year God's been speaking to you about getting involved with something, doing something, being involved in your church, or being involved and, and doing something for the Lord, whatever it may be, and you just quite didn't get it. You didn't, wasn't really sure, should I be singing? Should I be, you know, preaching? Should I be doing, the, you know, ushers or, or the usher air or usher meeting? Or should, should I be, you know, teaching a class? Should I be giving the food to the home? What should I be doing? And you kind of, you know God wants you to do something, but you just quite just can't quite get the understanding of it, right? And so here he goes to this man, and the guy goes, look, I had a vision too. And God told me, you're going to tell us everything that he commands you to tell us. And so I, I was thinking, thank God for the Corneliuses of the world. Your pastor, in a sense, is a, is a Cornelius. See, when I realized this, listen, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. With the help of Cornelius, he was able to understand what God was trying to do in his life and how he was going to use him. They're not, see, listen, world, they're not always there to give you an interpretation of the vision. But rather a platform or an opportunity for you to begin applying what God has used you to do. See, Cornelius wasn't there to give him an understanding of what he saw. He was there to give him a platform to begin to walk in what God called him to do. Your pastor, in a sense, is a Cornelius where he may not have the interpretation of what God's been talking, talking to you doing, but he's here to provide a platform, an opportunity to get involved, an opportunity to begin to walk in what God. Now, one thing I've learned is that what you do today and what you do in this next year, whatever God's called you to do, may not be the same thing you're doing five years from now. But it's what God's calling you to do today. Because in order to get to where you got to go, you got to go through today. Does that make sense? You got to go through the issues, through the problems, through the struggles, through the blessings. You got to learn how to pray, learn how to seek God, learn how to respond and call out to God. When God. You got to learn all that today in order to get to where you're going to go. I couldn't stand up here and preach to you about some things that I don't know nothing about if I didn't go through myself. But everything I have ministered behind the pulpit amen, is because I have gone through it myself. I have cried in a cell. I have cried out to God. You know, I, I remember there was times where I used to cry out to God. I said, Lord, Lord, you're God. I had just gotten saved. I was doing six years in prison, if you didn't know. And so I'm sitting in prison, and I remember in my cell, I said, Lord, get me out of here. Come on, God. You're God. You can open the doors. There's nothing impossible for you. And, and, and God, oh, I want to go home. I want to be my kids. I want to be, I, I be home, God. And I would cry sometimes. And I remember I'd be on my knees, and I'd pray. And I'd hear this small voice. After all this whining that I would do, God would say, just wait. I'd hear this small, distinct voice in the back of my head. And he would say, just wait. Just wait. And in my stubborn times, I'd say, I don't want to wait, God. <laughs> Open the door. And just wait. See, sometimes there's, an op there's things that God wants us to do, but he's got he's to do things in your life to get you there. And in this next year, I don't know what God's been showing you. I don't know what God's been doing in your life, amen. But my hope is that you would begin to walk in what God's called you to do, at least for now. You think, well, you know, I know people who are called to just pray behind the scenes. There was a pastor, Pastor Billy Hall, remember him? Pastor Billy Hall, every service he was called for a time, he'd be behind the service in a room praying for it during the whole entire service. That was his call. That's what he would do. That's what, he'd just pray. That's powerful, though. We think, well, that's, pff, I couldn't do that. I mean, do you know how, how I, I, pro I couldn't do it because I don't have the, the patience to sit there. But if God called me to do it, I would, I would find a way because God called. If you're called to do something, let me rephrase that. All of us are called to do something. And again, where you, what you do today may not be what you'll be doing five years from now. But you got to do what you need to do today to get you five years from now. Because it's part of what's going to strengthen you, prepare you, amen. It's going to be those things that's going to anchor you into the, king, into the kingdom, amen. You know, I started doing some research about some of the guys, amen, that, you know, uh, that had vision, like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You remember him? 
Martin Luther King Jr., man, he said, I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He had a dream. He had a vision. He saw it. He knew it was going to, it didn't happen in his day, but he knew it was going to happen. Amen. Another guy, Albert Einstein. Do you know that Albert Einstein was known as, I, I don't like to use the word, but this is what it said. He was known as to be retarded. Down soon, he had the, or not, he was mentally challenged is what they, another word they use. And the lady that used to watch him said that she thought he was weird because he had an abnormal sized head and that he was, he was odd. And so then, but here is, what, here is Albert Einstein, one of the greatest men in, in our history. One of the most intelligent, man, insightful men in our history because he had a vision. He had something inside him that he had to get out. He had to share it. And so he changed the world. Another man, one more. Winston Churchill. Anybody know who that is? Some of us won't, but some of us do. Winston Churchill, arguably one of the greatest leaders in the 20th century. He led Britain and allied forces to victory over Nazi Germany. But did you know that he struggled with depression? They called it the black dog of his day. And he was also bipolar. So he was erratic at times, and he was sad, really sad at times. And yet, one of the greatest leaders in the, Britain, in the Britain Army, in their history of the Britain Army, one of the greatest leaders, and, he's, and I wrote this quote because I had to share it. He says, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Never give in. Here's a man who struggled with depression, who struggled with being bipolar, amen, but he knew one thing, to fight, to not quit. He grabbed a hold, and he was able to look beyond, amen, and he was able to walk in his calling and do what he was called to do. You and I as Christians have to learn to fight, have to learn to keep going. Have to learn to not stop. Have to learn to not quit. Have to learn to not give up. Not run away. Not slack off. But have stay focused on the kingdom of God. Stay focused on your walk. Stay focused in prayer. Stay focused in the word. It is our responsibility. Let me tell you something. The worst thing you could do, and, and one of the worst things I think about hell, amen, is to be in hell and know that you didn't have to be there. One of the worst things in hell will be to know that you could have prevented. I'm not saying anybody's going to hell in this place, so don't get any ideas, right? Don't, 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 don't throw stones at me. But what I'm saying is that one of the worst things in hell is to know that you, you could have prevented that. You had every opportunity to get saved. You had every opportunity to hear the word. You had every opportunity to repent, amen, but you chose not to. That, to me, is the worst thing in hell, of hell. And no, we don't live in hell today because if you go to IB, man, it's beautiful sometimes. Amen? Listen, my last point, I'm almost done. Is that okay? I know I went a little long, but listen, my hope is that you'll impact someone's future. My hope is that you'll see that you can impact someone's future. Isaiah 61, real quick. Have you got that, Zach? The Spirit of the Lord, Luke 14, yeah. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Listen, that is our, should be our mantra, that God has anointed me. The, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has anointed you to preach the gospel. He has prepared you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you to go out and share the living gospel, to proclaim liberty and, and heal the broken hearts, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recovery of sight. Do you know that you can lay hands on someone and they can, they can see again? You can lay hands on somebody who's sick and they can be healed again. And you say, well, I've done that and no one gets healed. Well, that's God's problem, not ours. Our responsibility is to just be faithful and obedient and lay the hands and trust in the Lord that he can heal because I know my God can heal. But if he doesn't, that's on him. Not on me. So my question is to you today is this. Who will you reach in this new year, 2020? Whose life are you going to impact in this new year? How will you reach them? What are you willing to do? How far are you willing to go? How much are you willing to sacrifice? Be a blessing. Be an encourager. Meet someone where they're at and share the gospel that is transforming your life. How many believe that they believe in, in a gospel that's transforming your life? Do you believe in a gospel that's transforming your life? Then let that gospel transform somebody else's.
Because if it's good enough to transform yours, it's good enough to transform somebody else's. Does that make sense? So this, I'm going to say this. My second closing. The time of just coming and sitting in a chair needs to turn into involvement. I can say that because I don't go here. If you're coming here and just sitting in a chair, amen, turn it to involvement. Get involved. You know, there's a lot of things that you could do in the church. Every church needs something. You don't have to be behind a pulpit. You don't have to be out seen in front of everybody. Some, most people don't even like that, amen. And as a matter of fact, can I say this? This is the least position anybody should want. It really is. Because the best position is the, what, the, 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 the position that really influences. You know, I had a brother who used to go in and he used to clean the toilets and vacuum the floors and mop. Brother Javier. Impacted my life to this day. He used to clean the toilets, clean the, vacuum the floors, mop the floors, and that's what he did. And he took pride in it, though. That's what he did. There's other guys who've done all kinds of things. It's not always being seen and in front of everybody, but it's doing something for the kingdom of God. Because remember, what you do today is not what you're going to be doing five years from now. Amen? So why are you here? Are you here to make, be, make feel good, or are you here to serve a purpose? So I want to encourage you, run this new year. Listen, I'm a runner, and I'll end, this is what I'll end with, for real, for real. All right? This is what I'm going to end with. I'm a runner, and when I run, I have a goal. I run, you know, three, two, three, sometimes four miles, depending on how I feel, and I, I, I enjoy that. But I have a goal to finish whatever I start. And so if I've chosen to, to run three miles, I'm going to run three miles. Even I have to stop a little bit, catch my breath, and keep going. If I chose to run four miles, same thing. So my goal to you is this. If you've chosen to run with Christ in this new year, finish it. The reality is this could be your last year for all of us. Run it strong, baby. Run it strong. Amen? That's all I got for you. Let's all stand up in prayer. Come on.